Your contribution is invaluable to us. Your voice matters, and we are here to listen. Just to let you know part of our mandate so that you can put things into context, we are required to initiate, consult widely, and guide the national debate towards a generation of package of ideas and opinions which will be distilled into a working document which will become the working document for the Constitution Conference to be held in June. So we are not here to rewrite or draft any new constitution. We are here to listen and to record your views. And your views will inform the proposals we will make to the government. So with this in mind, I hope to have a very uh, instructive and informative meeting uh, with you this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to uh, Chairman Mr. Barindra Sinanan. Well, ladies and gentlemen, with a bit of a background as to understanding the Constitution and what has brought us to 2024, uh, please would you welcome Dr. Terence Farrell. Uh, thanks very much, Wendell, and uh, good uh, evening to everybody uh, who's here. Uh, let, let, me, let me start off by saying that uh, our, our committee is not at all phased by the numbers that we have. Uh, I, I, I say that whether we have two people or 200 people, it makes no difference. What, what, we, what we're doing is giving uh, the community an opportunity to speak, to articulate your views. Um, we know that some of you have already sent in uh, submissions to the committee via email, via the website. You may have responded to the questionnaire. But the town hall meetings that we are doing are an opportunity for you to articulate those views. Some of you who may not have had that opportunity to send uh, um, your submissions via email, well, this is an opportunity for you to do precisely that because we record uh, these proceedings. So everything that you say here is recorded, it's captured and the committee will be taking uh, everything that we, that we hear into consideration in our deliberations. Now, our deliberations um, and, and the work that we are doing as a committee is, is certainly not the first time, as you know, that this has been happening in Trinidad and Tobago. It's been, it's been going on for quite a while. Um, we, 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 you, can, you can either say that the process of, of, of this exercise is five months, or you can say that the process of this exercise is 50 years, because it's 50 years since the Wooding Commission reported in uh, January of 1974, uh, so exactly 50 years, 50 years ago. Uh, those recommendations of the Wooding Commission, most of the recommendations that they made were not accepted by the Prime Minister at the time, Eric Williams, and so therefore the 1976 constitution, which is the constitution that we have and we are operating with today, is a constitution which is 50 years old. Uh, and we make the point as well that it's actually more than 50 years old. Because although the Wooding Report, when you read it in in, in detail, and, I, and, and it's available on our website, as are all of the other uh, efforts at reform. It's an excellent report, very comprehensive. It would have been path-breaking if it had been implemented at the time, and it wasn't. And so therefore, what we had in the 1976 Constitution, and what we have in our Constitution today, because it hasn't changed uh, in the last 50 years, is that we have, in fact, the 1962 Independence Constitution. And it's important for us to realize, for us to remember, that that Independence Constitution in 1962 came about very, very hurriedly. It came about uh, as a result of Jamaica exiting the West Indies Federation in late 1961 as a result of the referendum that they had. 
uh, and, and propelled both Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago very quickly to go to London to become independent nations. Jamaica on August the 4th, Trinidad on August the 31st, 1962. And therefore the constitution, the independence constitution, was one that the essentially reflected a set of institutions and a set of institutional arrangements, a set of electoral arrangements, which essentially the British gave to us. It was the easiest thing to do at the time, and that's what we did, that's what Jamaica did, that's pretty much what all the other Caribbean countries did. So we took institutions from Britain. In fact, Williams, uh, this is before 1962, this is back in the 1950s, said, famously said that if the British constitution is good enough for the British, it's good enough for Trinidad and Tobago. So I'm, I'm, I'm pointing this out to make the point that in 2024, and especially for you younger people in the audience who are here, you are living today with a constitution, therefore with a set of institutional arrangements in terms of how the executive operates, how the judiciary operates, how the service commissions operate, how the parliament operates, how elections are run, that was designed 60, 70 years ago. And therefore reflected the thinking of the British 50, 60, 70 years ago. That's what we are operating with today. And you, especially for the young people here, are facing a set of circumstances. You're facing challenges of changing geopolitical environment. You're facing issues around climate change and so on, which are challenging not only Trinidad and Tobago, but every nation on the planet. Those arrangements, those institutional arrangements, we know haven't been working well. And we, with the manifestation of that, we see in all kinds of ways in our society, in terms of the, 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 the conflicts that we are seeing between institutions of the state, whether it is the Chief Justice and the, and the DPP, the Auditor General and the Minister of Finance, the, the issues around crime and criminality that we are seeing in the society, people on remand, in the remand yard, for five, seven, ten years, those problems that we are seeing are manifestations of a set of institutions in our society that are just not working well. And they've got to change. And the, the, the efforts of reform have come from every single administration that we have had in the country. So Williams tried to do it in, in the 1970s with the Willing Commission, and he did it propelled by the Black Power Movement in 1970 and the Regiment Mutiny and some of the things that were happening in terms of the society at that time, the high unemployment rate, so he figured that we needed to do something to fix that, and we didn't. And then A.N.R. Robinson, the NAR, in 1987, initiated the Higher Tally Commission to undertake constitutional reform. And then the Pandey administration uh, made some significant legislative changes, not changes to the Constitution, but important legislative changes in respect of the Integrity in Public Life Act, the Freedom of Information Act, the Judicial Review Act. That was also the time in 1996 when Tobago uh, was given a new piece of legislation to, go to govern the, 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 the island government in Tobago in 1996. And then Manning came along in 2002, to, he was obviously in 2002 and 2010, and he initiated a process of constitutional reform and had Ellis Clark work on a process of writing a constitution, rewriting the constitution of Trinidad and Tobago, focused in, 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 in his conception on the idea of an executive presidency, but making some other changes as well. And then there was a group of businessmen, which also included uh, religious leaders, uh, trade unionists, uh, and so on. This is the Principles of Fairness Committee, who in 2005, 2006, also drafted a constitution for Trinidad and Tobago. And then the UNC, People's Partnership Administration in 2013, had the Ramadan Committee, which worked between March and December of 2013, and did a report and did consultations around the country, and came up with a constitution amendment bill in 2015, which lapsed in Parliament, was never passed. So we have been going at this process now 
for 50 years. And the reason why we are going at it for 50 years is because, in my view, it seems as though every administration has recognized that there is a need to fix the Constitution, to fix the institutions which we will, the, the, the British bequest to us, in terms of these institutions, are no longer working for us. They were no longer working for the British. The British have since moved on. The institutions that they gave to Canada and to New Zealand and to other Commonwealth countries, they have since moved on. Singapore became independent. They have moved on. They changed their constitution from what the British gave to them. But we have remained stuck with these sets of institutions for over 60 years. And somehow we can't seem to find the way, the will, or the way to unlock that and to achieve reform, which is badly needed, as we can see. So that's the history of it. That's why we are here. This is the fifth time that we are making this attempt as a country, uh, because this has to do with the administration, which administration is in power. I pointed out that every single administration has attempted to do this. So it's not about that, it's about us, it's about the people of Trinidad and Tobago standing up at this point in time and saying it is enough time, it is time, enough is enough time to get this done now. And it's for the people of Trinidad and Tobago, not for this committee. We are a committee, we will take your views, we are taking the views of the public. We have had 900 email submissions We've had a host of submissions that have come from organizations around the country, NGOs, a couple of the political parties have sent in uh, submissions. We have consulted with experts, not only just lawyers, we've consulted with people who have been speaking to us about culture, about the society, about the politics, which is extremely important because at the end of the day, the Constitution is something that speaks. We, as a country speaking, to ourselves, about ourselves. So those are the other dimensions that we need to capture in a constitution. The constitution must reflect us. It must be we, the people, speaking to ourselves about ourselves. And we must have a preamble that is rewritten in that way. If nothing else changes in the constitution, we need to change the first several words of the constitution. Not from whereas the people of Trinidad and Tobago, so, 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 because the British gave it to us. But we, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, these are the things that we believe in. These are the things that we want. So it is for us, and we welcome you here this evening. We want to hear what you have to say, uh, and the moderator will indicate to you the process by which we'll take your views. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Farrell. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for your turn. Uh, to facilitate, there are two microphones in the room. And once you have approached the microphone, which you may do at uh, your leisure and at your time, we simply ask for the purpose of record keeping that you give a simple indication as to your, the location that you're from. Uh, no need to get into full details. And of course, your name just for record keeping. So let's start. Uh, we try to keep the time to about uh, five minutes per person, and that's really to ensure that everyone who is present is able to make their contribution. I therefore kindly ask for your cooperation in that regard, notwithstanding that you may have more ideas, recommendations, suggestions to contribute, let's be fair. Five minutes in the first instance, and once we've made the rounds, you certainly could be accommodated if there are other points that you wish to make thereafter. So if you see me ascend and make my way to the podium, that's because you've crossed the five minutes. Wrap it up. Thank you very much. And so the microphones are all yours. Please come forward. Let's go. Good evening. Good evening, um, members of the head table. Uh, members of the National Advisory Commission for Constitution Reform. My name is Lloyd Taylor, and I'm from Tunapuna. Welcome. Um, I simply want to state what I consider to be a few imperatives of constitutional revision, not only at this point in 
time of our history. But considerations we have to take into account as we go along. Constitution reform is an extremely political exercise, even though we are trying to do it without politics. And in the end, a people get the constitution they deserve because they get the government they deserve. So I briefly will detail the imperatives. I'm not going to go into any detail. And maybe we can talk about them later. The first imperative I think we need to address is the issue of civil liberties, human rights, and freedoms. And I think we need to address those because there is a need in the society to deepen those rights, to expand them, to define them more clearly. And the significance of those rights, those rights have to do with the fact that they provide the content for deepening individual sovereignty, without which we will not be able to sustain independence, political sovereignty, or whatever have you. The second thing I need to, I think, the second imperative I think we need to address is the issue of separation of powers. Separation of powers are not an end in themselves. And they are very important because that kind of institutional framework is what provides the content of education, culture, whatever you need, whatever you define it as, that goes into the individual to create and strengthen individual sovereignty. And that's the connection between that and civil liberties. And there are a number of things we have to do there, in my view. We have to reform the institutions of government. We have to, we have to limit the executive to no more than 15 to 20 members. We have to enlarge the House of Representatives by at least 20 members, in my view. And I am proposing that we also have to have an elected Senate. We could talk about how we see like that. The third imperative is that we have to strengthen the forces of national unity. And we have to pay attention to what areas in the Constitution, we can do that. The fourth imperative is to answer the 54-year-old question raised in 1970 of power to the people. We have dug that question in and out. We have never raised it. It doesn't matter which government goes into office. It's never sincerely answered. We have to address that. We can't leave it to chance. And one way to address that is to enshrine in the Constitution that communities have rights and to empower the Senate to, to manage the, budget, the, the, budgeting, the capital budgeting for these communities. We could come back to that at some other point in time. We have to strengthen territorial sovereignty. And the way we do that is by giving to Bego what Tobago needs and what Tobago deserves, subject to maintaining the unitary state of Trinidad and Tobago or some, of, some arrangement that accommodates it. The significance of doing right by Tobago is that it tells the rest of the Caribbean that we are serious about regional political integration. So when we, the way we treat Tobago must tell the rest of the Caribbean we are ready to embrace them embrace all these islands, all our kith and kin, to create something larger and more meaningful. And the sixth imperative is to strengthen and align regional statehood with the needs of Caribbean nationhood. It is C.L.R. James who has always reminded us that the Caribbean is a nation without a state. It's modern time that we put that together and solve that problem. If we didn't have all the problems of one from 10 leaves north and all that kind of thing, today 
we would have been able to deal with the Essequibo problem in Guyana, not by inviting the American troops, but by inviting ourselves to talk to the Venezuelans. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Good evening. Yeah. Hi. Hi, my name is Dean Allen, artist um, from St. Augustine. Welcome. All right. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, my point is, I just have two points, and I would like to think that the Constitution reform, if we think of it as important as we go along, I would like to see that there's more effort placed in how we do the reform process in the sense that every community, there should be at least nine to 12 months invested. There should be a national guideline on all radio stations to education constitutional programming. There should be um, constitutional students from the university in all communities. During the 70s, they had what they call the streetlight campaign Maybe we do a constitutional streetlight campaign in all communities targeting secondary, primary school, religious groups, civil societies, sitting down with them, going through the constitution page, page by page, and having rigorous philosophical debate around the constitution. After this nine to 12 months, the national community should be then therefore ready to have a vigorous and lively debate on what the constitution means to them and proper um, guidelines. And I think that will be something around proper social justice in having, I guess this will be one phase, but if you go into that next second national phase, that is the process I would like to see. Anything else? you have to capture for any democracy to consider this a democratic process, we will have to capture 60 to 70% of the national community voice. If you don't have that, we will never have a proper constitution. And I would like to think that the constitutional reform will be based on lawyers and technocrats and bureaucrats. My second point will be in the constitution and my, in the preamble, the human, um, yeah, um, Farrell, you mentioned institutions and the feelings of institutions, but it, institutions are made up of human beings. And in the Constitution preamble, it's very short on this, what this human being should look like and feel like. Um, and I think I would like to see a Constitution that expands on my right as a human being, a right to proper art, a right to a proper urban planning, a um, proper good design. I would like to see the right to um, a healthy environment and obviously a right to security. Now if we consider that we have certain human, human rights and culture and heritage, well then we will understand that our education and how we educate our humanity going into the future will be a constitutional right. As much as now the Wi-Fi is, a constitution, is becoming a human right in the society. And at this moment, I am the right to good craft. And we sit in a building that has built by our craft people. Every civilization that we understand could never survive without a healthy, healthy craft knowledge. And that will mean how we look at our elders, how we look at the middle, and how we look at the bottom in creating this new education paradigm. So I, that generally, um, I think we need to expand in the Constitution our humanity preamble. And this is why the first one is important, how we debate and philosophically go through 
what our humanity, what a strong humanity needs. The Constitution as it stands is just too bureaucratic and technocratic, and it leaves, it leaves out the most in fundamental aspect of a nation, and that is how do we grow and educate our humanity. And the failure of our society today is the feelings of our humanity. Thanks. Thank you very much. Good evening, welcome. One second, just let's uh, make sure that your microphone is on. And we'll go one more time. A little closer, please. Close, no. Closer yes, right there. there. Very good. Thank you. Good That's evening. That's a bit yes. too close for comfort. To the esteemed panel, my name is Budram Supasad. Welcome. And I'm from Gittin Street in Takariqua. And I want to comment or highlight some problems that I see in relation to a very narrow area of the Constitution, namely Section 17, that deals with citizenship of Trinidad and Tobago. As a retired public officer and one that worked in immigration, I am concerned that we con continue to confer or to grant citizenship by birth to anyone born on our soil. Right now in Trinidad and Tobago, we have at the government's estimate about 16,000, they say, Venezuelan migrants in Trinidad. I put the number closer to 100,000 from the amount of them I see all over the country, both those who have come in regularly and irregularly. And out of these, many of them come to, to access health care here. And many of them have children born in Trinidad and Tobago who will immediately on their birth be entitled to citizenship and to obtain a Trinidad and Tobago passport, whereas none of their parents has any legal or permanent status in this country. It means that when we deport or put out or expel, or if they voluntarily return to their native land, they would be returning with children with Trinidad and Tobago passports. Just think that in 16 years' time, there might be 5,000 children, such children, competing for spaces in our university who would have access to whatever grants or, 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 or um, financial incentives that the government would give to students attending tertiary and probably secondary school here. Right now, the only people in Trinidad and Tobago who are born here who are not entitled to citizenship are those children of diplomats, neither of whom has any permanent status in the country. I want to suggest to the esteemed panel that we consider doing like Great Britain has done and that America is doing right now and many other countries in the world where if neither parent has any form of legal permanent status in Trinidad, their child does not acquire citizenship of Trinidad and Tobago by birth. You can well imagine that when parents return with, to their homeland in Venezuela and there are benefits to be obtained from citizenship, their children would return to access those benefits. On the second part of that section 17 that deals with citizenship of Trinidad and Tobago by descent, we continue quite wrongly in my view to confer citizenship on people. Any child born outside of Trinidad and Tobago who's any, either one of their parents is a citizen is automatically a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago by birth. 
we have the sorry situation right now where scouts are searching all over Europe and North America looking for any children of Trinidad migrants in order to see whether they can play football to draft them in on our national team. Many of them have never visited Trinidad and Tobago in their life, does not know even who the Prime Minister is, does not know anything about our culture, our history, or about our land, and who continue to be granted and hold Trinidad and Tobago citizenship. I had a situation where a couple from Trinidad and Tobago, then British citizens who migrated to Venezuela in the 1940s, and who had children born there, and who had never one day in their life returned to Trinidad and Tobago, but the law conferred on them citizenship automatically. I had the case where they had a 60-year-old son who came to apply for citizenship of Trinidad and Tobago. He speaks not one single word of English. He has never visited our shores. He does not know anything about Trinidad and Tobago, but he is entitled to get a Trinidad passport and travel the world when he has no connection with Trinidad and Tobago. I had the case recently with my son, I went to the University of the West Indies for medical, to get into the medical, um, not campus, whatever it is, you understand? And he had to compete with three students, citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, all born abroad and who had never come here, but who came down here and were accepted for the program because they were citizens of Trinidad and Tobago um, automatically. Their parents never contributed a cent in taxes they had left and gone abroad, but their child is treated better than other Trinidadians who are living here and who contribute their taxes could not even get in to the, to, to, to the very limited amount of seats available. I ask you to consider whether we should confer or make it by application where they have to have a physical presence in Trinidad and Tobago and at least pass some kind of exam or some kind of uh, knowledge about Trinidad and Tobago before we confer citizenship on anyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Supersad. Evening, welcome. Good afternoon, good afternoon to the head table and the audience. Uh, my name is Martin Akers and I'm from El Dorado. I come here with seven points. Um, first point is, office holders working on behalf of the state must not act as if the office they sit behind is theirs and must act to serve the public at all times. Even if after leaving office, if he or she must still be held, if even if after leaving office, he or she must still be held liable for the wrongs they do. Even it should not just die there. Third, we cannot have it that the police are always liable for wrongs they do, but other professionals, be it lawyer, doctor, accountant, bankers, and the list goes on, gets away. They are not challenged. If there are challenge, it goes nowhere. Why is it that some people seem to be more equal than others? I believe judges should be made to disclose their financial position just as members of parliament. All agents of the state are to be held liable for their inefficiencies. Everyone, everyone and everything that moves should be guided by the Constitution, but in reality, it does not happen. 
That's all for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Akers. Good evening, sir. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. Um, just came to make a few points. Sure. Uh, my name is Ian Clark, and um, I vote in the St. Augustine constituency, but I consider myself an activist in the Tanapuna constituency. Okay. Um, my issue is really on the question of electoral reform, basically. And, um, yeah, sure. Right. It has been um, an issue that has been on my mind for a very long time, as a matter of fact, for the past 20 years or so, since the 2000 elections in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, when I first, I, had a, I prepared a little script, so I refer to it um, extensively to accommodate the time, Mr. Chairman. Right? Um, when I first raised this issue uh, with a friend of mine, he suggested that what I was proposing sounded like proportional representation. Right? At that time, I had no idea whatsoever about what proportional reputation, representation was about. Um, he mentioned also that in Trinidad and Tobago, a lot of political commentary was of the view that the concept of proportional representation should not be considered at all in the Trinidad and Tobago context. He, he mentioned that to me. He also mentioned to me um, that Dr. Eric Williams had complete reservations about the, res about the recommendations of the, the Wooding Commission, which suggested a mixed form of proportional representation. That was in 1974, I believe. All right? And of course, in those days, I'm old enough to remember that he's saying that if the doc says so, it's so. Right? So as someone mentioned earlier on, um, that question, the, the recommendations of the Wooding Commission didn't get any major traction through Trinidad and Tobago at the time. Right? But of course, um, as another friend of mine reminded me recently, he said that um, the world has changed since Dr. Williams made his statement in 1974. And indeed, the world has changed. I am proposing, um, therefore, the expansion of the House of Representatives to cater for candidates who receive at least one third of the votes cast in any constituency coming out of the election process. Once you achieve one third of the votes cast, I think that that candidate should be allowed an opportunity to sit in the House of Representatives and articulate the position of his supporters within a constituency area. Now, I know that the Wooding Commission had recommended a, a marker of 5% of the vote. I am in disagreement with that 5%. I think that the threshold for determining the ability of a candidate to sit in the House of Representatives should be at least one third of the vote. Right? At least one third. Because you have to demonstrate that, in my opinion, that you have a significant degree of support within your constituency. So I don't buy the, I don't buy the 5%. I think that is a very low threshold. 
and that the threshold should be at least one third. Okay. Now, I am also of the view that in a highly political, polarized society as currently exists in Trinidad and Tobago, I am advocating that there must be some adjustment to the winner-take-all, first-past-the-post situation. We entered that, for the, as, as the chairman mentioned earlier, for the past 50, 60 years. We have been in that narrow gap, and I am suggesting that we have to broaden that and, and, and make the process a lot more democratic, in my view, and allow for, for more representation in the House of Representatives. Um, like I said, I have a few notes, so I want to refer to it. Um, the question would then arise in the, in the system that I am proposing, is that what you would find is a, in each constituency, well, in constituency where there's a one-third uh, marker and more than one, one, more than one candidate achieves that marker, you will have a situation where you have a, a, a majority representative and a minority representative, right? Of course, the majority representative would, be, would, would, would reflect the person who received the higher vote. And of course, the minority guy would be the person who you achieved the wanted, but lesser than the majority. So in each constituency of that type, you will have a majority and a minority. And let me just go, I mean, the concept of, let me just say that the concept of proportional representation is a very popular form of democracy in countries in the world today. Lots of countries throughout Europe in particular, there are examples of proportional representation in existence. Right? Um, we could go down and mention some of that, but I will not do that at this time. Um, like Germany, New Zealand, Sweden, Norway, the Netherlands, South Africa, Denmark, and so on and so on and so on. Right? But I just want to bring home a particular point which prompted me to have this idea in my head for over 20 years. Right? And this is a very concrete situation. Um, and I had a note here. As someone involved in several parliamentary election campaigns between 1991 and, and 20,000 in the Tanapuna constituency, I have often thought of the persons in the constituency who voted in support of the losing candidate. And in particular, where the outcome of the voting process was very close. This is a matter that I have pondered on for over 20 years, and in particular, after the outcome of the elections of 2000, when the PNM candidate for the constituency of Tunapuna, Mr. Edward Hart, lost the Tunapuna seat to Mr. Mervyn Assam of the UNC by approximately 442 votes. In that election, with a voter turnout of 68.5% of eligible electors of 26,267, 17,788 persons cast their ballot. 8,906 electors cast their ballot for moving Assam, while 8,464 voted for Edward Hart. All right? In this example, both candidates would have gotten in excess of one third of the vote. Of course, in the subsequent election, which was called in 2001, I see you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Mr. Hart reversed the decision in the Tanapuna area. Now, a lot of um, talk has been going around. I just want to make two final points. A lot of talks, a talk has been going around about 
the, the question of the total, what's the, what's the correct term? I'm not sure what it is. But the, I'm focusing you now on the role of the youth, of the young people. If you want to get young people involved in the electoral process, you have to make things interesting for them, right? And I am suggesting that my recommendation of one to opens up opportunities for young people to see that they can get involved and do something meaningful for their communities. They could become involved in the political affairs of the country. They can join political parties and become office holders and be in a position to influence the direction and programs of the party, whatever party they exist in. Um, it can also spark interests of citizens who do not participate in the voting process. And as we are all aware, there are many people who do not participate in the voting process in Trinidad and Tobago. Many of them stay away from the polls. We know that. Right? It is also possible that with the involvement of young persons with different political groups, they might find common ground on many issues. For instance, early childhood education, sporting and artistic needs. My brother here mentioned the whole question of arts and culture. Sanitation, question of health care, and so on. You may find that all of you from different political organizations, from a young person perspective, they may share similar views. And therefore, the articulation of those views within a community. For remember, we're talking about one third of the persons who are eligible being able to participate all year long. I mean, through the five years, rather. Through the five years. Because as we know also in Trinidad and Tobago, if you can get lose, you go on back and wait for five years before you could come back to the polls. Right? So, ladies and gentlemen, I don't mean to, I have a few other notes, but I wouldn't go into this at, that, at this point in time, except to make one final point, Mr. Chairman. And that's the question of, um, MPs, my view is that MPs should be full-time, full-time. An MP shouldn't have a ministerial responsibility. An MP should be doing the work of the people within the community. And the MP should also have the support of the parliament who would organize appropriate rental, rental accommodation, secretarial staffing, etc., 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 so that you can really do something of significance in terms of representation within your community. Right? There are, there are, like I said, there are a few other things, but I will stop at this point in time. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Clark. And I did say, once we've gone around, you can return. So there is another opportunity. You're very welcome. Good evening, welcome. My name is Dr. Stanley Bishop. Don't let the accent fool you. I was born here. <laughs> I am the grandson of Archbishop Elton Griffith. I'm sure you know who that is, the spiritual Baptist liberator. I am from a family of ex-policemen, I'm also a family of brilliant, intelligent people. I'm from Mokoya Gardens, which in the Tunapuna area is known as the PNM Nest. <laughs> I am a former lecturer, psychology, UE Main Campus, Open Campus. There's a few issues that I need to present and you all could take notes and see if there is something you can do in revitalizing the Constitution. I am also a forensic psychologist, the only licensed forensic psychologist in Trinidad and Tobago. I am in the law archives. If you Google Dr. Stanley Bishop, TT Law Courts, you will see the work that I have done for Trinidad and Tobago. I'm sure Mr. Wendell probably recognized my face. I used to be the psychologist on Community Dateline, 
with Alison Hennessy. I put psychology on the map of Trinidad and Tobago. I have done high court cases. I have saved so-called criminals. And I said so-called because one of the cases that allowed me to be in the law archives is a young lady who had killed her baby and I was able to prove for the first time in Trinidad and Tobago that the woman was hearing voices. Her name is Michelle Thomas. She is free, living in the United States. The reason why I'm here today is basically to present something in the form of a concern. With all that I have presented to you, and there's more that I would, but I wouldn't, because I would get a little bit furious. I am a pensioner. I have been running back and forth to the Tunapuna NIB office for three years. Some of you are looking around and saying, what? <laughs> three years. One of the main reasons is this. My last name is Bishop. One of the smart persons inside of there changed my name to Griffith. Believe it or not. Last year, I was supposed to collect on my lump sum because I'm so fed up with it. They acknowledged that I was supposed to collect my lump sum in September. We're in 2024. I was there last month. They're telling me to come back. Is there something you all can do about that? In terms of reformation? I'm also a recipient of negative vibes from across the street here. Social welfare. <laughs> Seems those bad things happen to me, but I have my grandfather's spirit. If you would check in the archives of the PNM, you will see a black man with a headpiece like he's a pope. That is Elton George Griffith right behind Dr. Eric Williams. He was always with him and Mr. Gomes. Now, the pension board also has been playing games. You all need to check into that and make some sort of constitutional reformation because not only I, there are other citizens. We're just looking at the Tunapuna area. I do have contact with the Minister of Communication, Dino Rogier, and also the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister know my family in Tobago, Zion Hill. And for those of you who don't believe that the Prime Minister works for you, he has been working for me. I get results from him, as well as from the um, Community of Communication. The Pension Board had me as number 41 in the Tunapuna area for them to give me my pension. I got in touch with the Prime Minister's office through Mr. Norugia, and I was able to get by my recommendation that they need social workers, additional social workers across in the pension board. So lo and behold, after running ragged for about five months, I got a phone call from the pension board saying, hey, we need to fast track your stuff. Now I am not going to settle for that because as I said before, there's other pensioners who've been going through hell in that office there, just as other retirees been going through hell at the NIB office. One last thing before I leave. You see, I'm walking around with this here. I'm a, related to Ian Bishop. He's my cousin. And no, he didn't retire because he blew out his back. We have what's called the Bishop Curse, which is multiple sclerosis. That is why he quit. Okay? Now, I'm also an asthmatic. Like I said, I live in Mukoya Gardens. Last year, the weekend of Diwali, I had an asthma attack. And the following weekend, I had another asthma attack. Triggered by my neighbor not cleaning his dog feces. Okay? I'm a scientist. I, my background is psychology and biochemistry. 
Uric acid and pneumonia triggers asthmatic condition. I also have what is called obstructive pulmonary disorder. When I was in the hospital, I got in touch with Minister de Nourogier and have him got in touch with public health. Public health, right next door here, play games. Okay, you know that. <laughs> they play games. The logic in me said, get in touch with another district. So I called San Fernando area and I got in touch with a woman by the name of Dr. Reyes and we liaised on the telephone and she was able to give me some assistance. She's the one who had recommended to me that the fine, I believe it's $300 if the person is held, is found guilty of having a dirty yard, that fee needs to be increased. I am in support of that. Why? It's because I had two consecutive asthmatic attacks because my neighbor didn't clean his yard. I'm at number eight, he's at number six. Now you know, for those of you who know Mukoya Gardens, the houses are approximately 65 feet away from each other. And the way that the government had built the houses back in the day, my kitchen is here, where that microphone is there, that's my neighbor's yard and the toilet. Seriously, okay? Now I said that to say that something needs to be done in terms of the Constitution so that the fee, and Dr. Reyes agree with me, if the fee is increased, I think people are going to be serious about keeping the yard clean. That is my contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bishop. Good evening, sir. Welcome. Well, thanks. Testing. Cool. Go ahead. Yes. All clear. Go ahead. Good afternoon to the head table. As you all know, my face I, I presented in Arima, right? However, when I saw when I saw the recording, my presentation was completely left out. I don't know if it could be an error on the um, people who, who were charged with recording. Go ahead. Your situation was brought to my attention earlier on today. Um, and for some reason, you are correct. Your, your contribution was in fact deleted. Now we are investigating that. Now what you, your contribution however, was in fact recorded by our chief legal officer. So it's not that it's lost, it's there. I was called by people in Arima and said, but Jazzy, what's going on there? Oh, everybody spoke at your presentation which was so mesmerizing and alluding to the head table was left out. So I said, let me come and represent again, so I won't be left out this time again, Mr. Barra. Can I give the permission to represent? Maybe you'll get the thoughts a second time. I have some more I want to bring to you. All right, no problem. It, it will be very short. You have my contribution? All right, so I like that. Okay, one, there continues to be perceived infractions with respect to the separation of duties amongst the parliamentary, executive, and judicial arms of the state. It must be noted that while it is nearly impossible, it is impossible to manage morality, While it is impossible to manage morality and ethical behaviors in public office, a strong consequence management framework must be installed, right? 
So, so citizens can feel comfortable that separations of powers are respected. Our Westminster model, we look at separation of powers, but that was based on ethical and moral behaviors. How are we going to address our moral and behaviors of our politicians and members of public office? Who is going to more charge that? So when, our, uh, when this happened, look, at, look, Mr. Farris, just talk about it, the imbroglio with respect to the, the, um, uh, to, um, the Attorney General, the Minister of Finance, and the, the Solicitor General. And this, and this is back and forth. And who is going to pay the bills of the state is taxpayers, and we need to address those issues. We need to address it now because it is going on too long. We need to understand that cause, legal cause and interpretation of the Constitution must stop. It must be written as clearly as I said last week and defined, so you will have that, okay? How the committee is set up, that is well, a very difficult committee because I think that committee should include lower house members, upper house members and members of the public randomly judge us like jury service. We need that. So they, so the, because the integrity commission is not doing anything. We saw that one person spoke out, his term was up and he is removed. Okay? So we need to fix that problem. Okay? Performance metrics must be created for senior public office holders, including members of parliament and the upper house, similar to the private sector. So non-performers can be addressed in a similar manner as in the private sector. I heard people talking about MPs performance and the separation of duties with respect when they are ministers and being representation. All right, well measure your performance. Because we are paying members of opposition who only says we don't get no money, we don't get nothing. And what else after? And taxpayers are paying this money, and as, as you know, people want money. If you work in the private sector, and you are not given a valid value as a senior manager, what has happened? You are given a warning letter on performance, and you have your 360 feedback, and if, you, and, and, and if the non-performance persists, what happens, Mr. Chairman? You are asked to separate from the company, okay? We need to put in that. Cool. It is now time that our constitution look at aging leaders' legislation on the ability of the office holder once mental and physical examinations are satisfied. Furthermore, the upper house must address the inequity of selected elected senators and independent senators since the opposition senators have faced the polls versus independent senators who are appointed by the president. So we need to reshuffle 10 versus 6. Find a way to fix it. It needs to be fixed. I hear you for time. It is my view and my humble opinion that the Attorney General should be apply an applied position from the public, from an independent external HR company. One, that is the first step. Right? Once, the, once you create three finalists screen on to three candidates, a body of civil servants consisting of permanent secretaries and civil service officers from the Civil Service Commission now can, can engage in public hearings because last time I presented, I might talk about the hearings like in the Americas where if you want to be thinking, they are questioned in the Senate committee hearings by the public in front of the public view, which is done on C-SPAN. So, Officers enjoy the public. Each candidate and a final decision is made. No longer should the Attorney General be a political dispensation. It must be mandated. Well, before I start, according to the World Intellect Property Organization, and Mr. Farrell, you will understand that we rank 122nd in innovation. We rank as a 2022. So all the innovation we talk about, we rank 122 out of 130 countries. That is where we rank. So most countries, their budgets have a percentage of GDP for research and development. That's fitting well with the triple helix model of innovation. Okay, so I recommend approximately our GDP is 155 billion TT dollars. 
If you take 1,000 of 1% 1 of that, we get $15,500,000 for research and development. And this must be managed by a committee, not NEHUS, but a committee of bright inventors to push, push, push research and development. We lack our and the and Tobago. And these things that they're talking about by Kariri, them things don't make sense. We want good, solid research and development, which is includes the triple helix model of innovation, whereby universities, the state, and private sector work together to solve issues here in Trinidad and Tobago, which is done in Singapore and these big countries. We need to decentralize the role of the DPP. Like in the United States, a DPP they have district attorneys for every state. I am recommending that the DPP office be how we have five DPPs instead. One in each cluster, north, east, central, west, and south. So the DPP cannot say he has plenty work. We need five DCP and move it from a director of public prosecution to a district attorney or a cluster attorney or something. That is an old colonial thinking. One DPP cannot handle the problems we have in the justice system right now. And for all the talk you seen on the papers today, even so the Dana Sita Hall murder, look what's going on. We need to decentralize the DPP roles to have about five and call them district attorneys or cluster attorneys. Watching my time. Another thing, we need to have data, evidence-based decision making on all ministries. For example, if I want to go on the Ministry of Education website to see how a secondary school has done at the CXC level in the last 10 years, I have to file a freedom of information request. Why is that so? Why I just can't go to the website and tell the print, go on Arima Senior Comprehensive School, in the last 10 years, they have failed to receive over five levels or percentage of students. Why is it should be a freedom of information request? We have the right in every ministry to have data, selection, and statistics on their performance of every ministry. How much food God is giving me social ministry? It must not be a minister coming in parliament and speaking about it. It must be on a ministry for the citizens to see. Because the citizens deserve the right to know where their taxpayers' money is spending. <clears throat> now, everybody was talking about the problem with the laws and constitution. As I said last week, while this, this is a very commendable effort, if we cannot get the two-thirds and the three-fifths in parliament, this is an exercise in fertility. Would you agree with me, the panel? Would you agree with me, Mr. Chairman? If we don't get it right, these laws need three fifths and two. So where everybody speaks here. What we need to pass in the law, a law must be passed to make sure that the upper and the law house pass at least two constitutional laws every year. So make a law like the Heritage Relation, whereby you must put in money. We must make a law in our constitution, whereby you, the upper house and laws, must make at least two laws every year. So there must be bipartisan agreement, anything for the benefit of the people. There is no laws that pass in laws. We need to write those in the laws. We must pass at least two constitutional motion laws, which it is, it is within one year. So there must be bipartisan politics. So the 41 members will come together and say, this is for the citizens, because it's all about the citizens, not political parties. As it is right now, what the citizens see is two political parties fight over state resources every five years and they are not seen by the citizens, okay? So I think that might wrap up my time because as I said last week, all I hear me, and I hope this time I will be, my ARIMA presentation, to Napona presentation will be on the website, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, welcome. Thank you so much. Hi, good evening again. Um, my name is Leah Thompson from Arima. Um, I did make a presentation to this committee um, at the Arima um, consultation, but I'm here tonight on behalf of an organization called the Caribbean Association for Feminist Research and Action, Trinidad and Tobago, CAFRA TT. Um, we just want to make a few points relative to the proceedings today. 
Um, we want to recommend that the savings law clause be removed. Um, I did mention this already, I won't go into too much detail, but just to say this came up again at a recent forum at the UE Department of Political Sciences and the Deputy Dean of the UE Law Faculty, uh, Timothy Alfonso, said basically uh, the first thing that he would change in the Constitution is to remove that savings law clause. It was never meant to last this long. It was meant to be transitionary, et cetera, et cetera. So it really is a well-held position that the savings law clause needs to go. We'd also like to recommend that the following rights be added to the Constitution. Some of these rights have been interpreted in different court matters as being included under other rights, but we do think that these need to be explicitly enshrined, in particular the right to privacy. There's been an ongoing controversy around whether or not the right to privacy exists in our jurisdiction. The Attorney General at the time in 2016 said it does not exist. Michael DeLabasse came out and said it does exist, it's just not defined. So some clarity around that I think is necessary. The right to privacy is a necessary precondition of a lot of the other rights, um, including our fundamental right to liberty, dignity, and equality. We'd also like to recommend that the right to have a speedy court hearing, a speedy trial, is enshrined explicitly, or at least um, a trial within a reasonable time. As was mentioned earlier, folks are waiting for five, sometimes 10, sometimes 15 years for a trial. This is having an impact, um, obviously, on the prisoners. We hear about all the stories about the terrible conditions on remand, in the remand prison. It is also having a very, you know, horrible impact on victims as well. In particular, victims of who report sexual offenses are uh, having to wait many, many years to have, and these issues are being dragged out many years while they wait for justice um, or, or trial on these types of matters. That kind of lengthy delay really has a human cost both to the prisoner and to, um, or the perpetrator and the victim. We also want to call for a right to decent work um, that has been defined by the ILO to include things like a fair income or living wage, security in the workplace, social protection, responsibilities, um, sorry, possibilities for personal development, freedom to participate in decision making within your workplace as well. Um, as someone who has worked for the public service, as someone who has had friends leave Trinidad because of not being able to really feel fulfilled within the job options that are available. We think that it's important that this be enshrined and we have some mechanism by which to advocate for better working conditions. We also want to call for uh, sexual orientation and gender identity to be added to the list of protected classes. So I'm asking for this on behalf of the organization, but also as an individual, as a bisexual woman living in Trinidad and Tobago, um, People, LGBT people in the Caribbean and in Trinidad and Tobago experience discrimination daily. Um, there are no real protections for them, uh, for us. Um, the principles of fairness draft constitution also explicitly recommended that sexual orientation be included as a protected class, and we want to also recommend that. We also want to, again, um, reference in the principles of fairness draft, want to say that the rights of the child should be explicitly included in the Constitution as well. Section 29 of that draft talks about quite a few different rights, including the right to basic nutrition, shelter, health care, to be protected from maltreatment, exploitative labor practice, etc. We know we do have a child or children's act. We also know that maybe very, very shortly after that children's act was passed, folks were in court challenging the way it was being implemented and executed under constitutional law. We think it is important for these rights to be explicitly enshrined. And my final point is that we would like to recommend um, around the ombudsman, or perhaps it should be changed to ombudsperson. We'd like to recommend that a protocol for the ombudsperson to deal with complaints by female victims of violence be adopted, and that the role of the ombudsperson be expanded accordingly. This protocol actually was already developed by UN Women Caribbean in 2011 in partnership with the Caribbean Ombudsman Association and the Association of Caribbean Commissioners of Police. It requires that that office work collaboratively with the police and other service providers to do a slew of things I'm not going to go through right now, but 
It talks about them receiving and reviewing complaints. It talks about them referring victims, answering questions about the rights of victims, and basically being part of that process of redress for victims of gender-based violence. That protocol was presented at the 10th World Conference of the International Ombudsman Institute by Roberta Clark. Roberta Clark is uh, currently a commissioner on the Inter-American Inter Commission of Human Rights. She's also the president of the Coalition Against Domestic Violence right here in Trinidad and Tobago. And she stated at that conference, there really is a consensus growing that the ombudsperson as an institution can strengthen the rights-based framework within which public policies are developed and implemented, and more particularly can support the administration of justice, and in particular the, the police, strengthen, help them strengthen adherence to the rule of law, and ensure access to justice, in particular for victims of gender-based violence. So we want to recommend that that rule be expanded, and that they also be given more power. So we know they have the power to investigate, but more powers to also address the issues that come up. Um, and on that, I will say thank you so much for your time. And thank you, Ms. Thompson. I will let's, uh, we're asking if you just make your way to the front microphone. You can facilitate, no, sorry. We're asking if you can come to the front microphone, please. Good evening, Good evening and Good welcome. Good evening, everyone. And I'd just like to say that I'm also associated with the comments of our my, my predecessor, because I'm also a member of that organization. But I wanted to bring some different comments on behalf of another organization. Just may I ask, sorry, just for the record. My name. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sorry. I'm Rhoda Reddock. <laughs> thank you. I'm representing here Data and Projects. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Data and Projects, developing art and design awareness is a non-governmental organization of persons who are concerned about the quality and aesthetics of public spaces in Trinidad and Tobago. And we work to facilitate the integration of art and design into, our, into the organization and management of public space. We believe that our current physical and built environment is ugly, physically unsafe for the elderly and the disabled, and this is worse in depressed communities. In our recent symposium held in November 2023, entitled Social Art and Design, Public Space and Community Transformation, organized in collaboration with the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago, Professor Jared Hutchinson highlighted the importance of a pleasing and aesthetically pleasing and a healthy public environment for the mental and physical well-being of citizens. Public space appears not to be protected and can often be taken over and lost by hyper-commercialization where public space included legally designated reserved areas and leg legally designated park spaces in housing developments, for example, are not developed as parks, not maintained, and therefore not able to be used by the public or community. And this is something that's designated by law and these spaces are eventually lost to construction. We are concerned at the loss of forested spaces that are supposed to be legally protected, like some of our, our um, anyway, that are being encroached upon illegally by persons from all levels of the society with little response from the relevant authorities this threatens our biodiversity and has serious implications in relation to climate change impacts. The right to a healthy environment has gained constitutional recognition and protection in more than 100 countries. We call for the constitutional recognition and protection of the environment 
and the right to a healthy and aesthetically pleasing environment enshrined in the Constitution. We would like to stress the right and the need to integrate art and beauty into our public and community spaces. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Good evening, sir. Welcome. Hi. Pleasant, um, pleasant good afternoon to the head tables. Um, my name is Anthony Meloni from Arima. Sorry, Anthony? Anthony Meloni from Arima. Thank you. I'm Arima. Oh, come forward. Right? Yeah. Um, well, I see Ms. Dr uh, Senator Drayton. I was there uh, when they had this symposium of um, constitutional reform. We were in Arima. Then we were in Port of Spain when they moved with the runoff bill and there was a lot of protests going on. And my, my observation where the Constitution is concerned, even today I was looking at the Ombudsman, I was looking at um, his function, the role, and after hearing all of this reading, and then tonight we heard in the open re uh, redress, addressed to the uh, uh, members, I am um, come back to the same thought. Where are we going with the Constitution? Because we heard about Hugh Wooden, we heard about the, the British, we heard about 1962, Dr. Eric William, 1974, the Republic. But where are we going? And what I gather tonight is that we all are looking for a solution to this problem that we are faced with. There are many proposals, many ideas, thought goes out. But to me, in my observation, I think we should bring the Constitution to the younger minds from the elementary school level. And I'm saying this because when we have a knowledge of the Constitution, our conversation would be better. And we will have a situation that where we could converse with each other, we could have our own referendum, like tonight and in these um, meetings. You, you see very few people attending because much adult, even in my age and, and younger, younger, they do not have a prior knowledge of the Constitution except they may hear somebody and hear somebody say this, and that is all about it. So I am thinking, if they could bring it to the schools, from, I'm talking about from elementary school level, and they move up from there, you find that in that, it's like, uh, uh, I want to use an illustration, like driving. If, if you never learn to use the nation road, all these signs and things, you may have problems. Or you cannot get a permit from the state. When you know about something and understand it, you approach it properly. And this is why I'm saying that education is one of the key in this whole thing about the country. Because I go to these things many, said so last time I saw uh, Minister Draper was in Arima with... Um, Ramada um, from St. Augustine. And tonight again, is the same thing I hear. And they are really hearing nothing different. So I, I think in when I heard in our remarks, I wonder if it is political game again because one government played on constitutional reform, they get into government and what they have done. So I don't know if tonight because of an election is coming, is the same thing. But I know that we really have a problem with our constitution. And I think if we bring it from that level, I think it might make a 
different because our conversation may be different. Look, um, Jazzy is telling me about this um, thing we have here. I could take it on the block with them guys and them. And I try to hold constitutional conversation, even like what's going on now, right? With the, the three billion you can't give an account, what does the constitution say? Where is the, in the constitution defends us as taxpayers? And some people, they, they don't concern about that. The ombudsman, as the lady was saying, we, we look at the prison in the Raymond Yard, how they, they are, and there's a lot of things I could raise, but I think we have to bring this to the school. That's my point of view. I, uh, that's not my point. Of view. Thank you, Ms. Maloney. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Welcome. And good evening. Pleasant and good evening. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. The Bef King James Version. Uh, before you go to the... Uh, no, I, I, I'm going to introduce myself. Thank you. I have a little process I go and I do things. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. The King James Version. But we are all an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. And all our inequities have taken us away. Good evening to members on the panel, the moderator, and all other persons inside this room. In the year 1901, a group of French archaeologists were excavating a site in Susa, which is now part of modern-day Iran. And they found a large stone tablet with an ancient text on it. It was discovered that that text was between 1755 to 1750 before the birth of Christ. It was the Akkadian language, and it was the language used by the Babylonian. Scholars translated that language and discovered it was the code of King Hammurabi, the ruler of Babylon. That code of King Hammurabi was a system of laws which ranged from family law, land law, criminal law, tort, etc., 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 I have read some of those laws, and two things become apparent. One, punishments for the transgression of those laws were brutal. Two, two, those laws had a particular pattern to it. If this was done, then that will, will happen. If this was done, that will happen, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. One law that resonated with me the most was law 229. It says if a builder builds a house and it collapses, then the, and collapses and kills the owner, then the builder will be put to death. And I think that is crucial for constitutional reform. A gentleman by the name of Nassim Talib wrote the book, Skin in the Game. And essentially what he is saying is that when decision makers are in a situation whereby there's a low probability of personal risk being attached to their actions, and or the magnitude of that risk is relatively small. They will engage in risk-seeking behavior, thereby causing other people to incur losses. This is evident throughout Trinidad and Tobago by the actions of certain persons in different arms of government and under the purview of the Service Commission. More often than not, their risk-seeking behavior is attributed to incompetence, carelessness, and of course, deliberate acts. When this happens, two types of persons suffer. One, the state, and two, citizens of this country. I believe the broad immunity is given to agents of the state should be greatly reduced. I, I believe that in, take, for example, in the case law with the Caparo Dickman test, foreseeability, proximity, fair, just, and reasonable. I believe like, something like that. It should be enshrined in the Constitution, which other laws are subservient to it. I also believe that all agents of the state must take out some professional indemnity insurance. So in the event the state does not cover 
their liability, a professional indemnity insurance will kick in. Now, the reason why I want a professional indemnity insurance is that will have to reduce risk-seeking behavior. One, if a professional indemnity insurance is paid out, it means that agent of the state have to pay out an excess. Two, if a professional indemnity insurance is paid out, it means that agent of the state have become more risky to insure and thereby their insurance premiums will go up. So in cases where accidents do happen, we are now able to shift the liability from the state onto the agent of the state, where the state and citizens could take civil action against those individuals. A few years ago with the baby, with baby Cuttle, it had a doctor, I ain't, I ain't want to get swear, so I tread in very carefully. 